discussion between private and public partners working to accelerate the development of fusion energy for humanity. Let me take a minute and thank uh, those in the UNFCCC, Gabriella Hirsch, our host, as well as the many who have worked to include fusion energy on this stage here at COP27. I'm Jane Hotchkiss, the president of Energy for the Common Good, an NGO, perhaps the only NGO so far, working to bring fusion to the world soon enough to make a difference on climate change. I came to fusion 10 years ago from a climate career in renewable energy, from policies to project development, and I was frustrated. Frustrated by the speed and the obstacles that we humans put in front of all developers. We needed something more, a partner that would ease the fears that delayed renewable energy moving forward and was able to produce the kind of power that we need to combat climate change and put simply, uh, replace fossils. I have learned firsthand of good technology and economics using the best projects to be delayed to death. And that was in 2012. We, 10 years later, we're out of time. And now we know that even massive global renewable energy development alone cannot replace fossils soon enough to make a difference. And keep pace with growth, uh, much less equity. Fusion, however, has the potential to be climate missing partners. And that's why I'm introducing it here to all of you today. It's nearly here. Many of you, either in the viewing audience or here, have probably heard of fusion, and if you have, you, you think it's far, far away or impossible. Well, guess what? It's nearly here. After 50 years of study, we now have 30 plus companies creating energy by mimicking the, the physics of our sun and stars. Some of them call it star and bottle. How do we do this? For those of you not as technologically uh, brilliant as many of the physicists I work among, we do this very simply, the basics, using heavy hydrogen in a few drop found in a few drops of water. Heat it to plasma and confined by superconducting magnets or targeted by lasers or another hybrid structure. Once confined or engaged, these hydrogen protons crash and release immense amounts of energy. This energy can be used, and this is the important part, to replace the, the boiler, now large fossil, in refining conventional power plants, or as direct heat for industry, as dense energy for processing. And as pilot institutes approach, this is producing hydrogen or other fuels. And it, most importantly of all, it does this without significant long-lasting waste, national security issues, geographic supply constraints, or proliferation. And best of all, there's no chain reaction here, just really, really difficult physics. Half happily, though, engineering and new materials, supercomputing, and construction have changed games. Fusion timeline is nearing. That's why we formed this ready the world for what happens when fusion devices, devices appear. Will the communities of the world trust this new, long hoped for old rail of energy? Who will want the power devices? Who will build them? And who will invest in them? And how can we be ready to employ fusion in speeding up our transition away from fossil and towards the energy equity all deserve? We think of ETT as fusion's knowledge transfer team. Building a network for clean energy planning is based on crucial literacy for the future. We are piloting climate confusion curriculum begun with underserved public classrooms and energy and in energy impacted communities. We go and we act ahead of the need. We were building the relationships that will then be excited to welcome you. Climate change is at our doorstep. Capturing fusion gives us hope for the community's challenges. Now please join me in watching a short video.
but I'll tell you all, I've seen this video many times, it still chokes me up. That's how important Houston is and that's how exciting it is to be in this moment in time. Now, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our panel. On my far right, we have uh, Tim Bestwick, the Chief Technology Officer for the UK AEA of Publicly Funded National Fusion Laboratory in England. Next to him is David Livingston, Senior Advisor to Special U.S. Presidential Envoy Carrick, and very kindly joining us here today. Now, in the center is the newest and perhaps greatest of the fusion, uh, fusion voices to arrive. Uh, and I know she'll scold me for saying that later, but I had to say it anyway. Gabriella Hurst, the Creative Director of Chloe and founder of Gabriella Hurst Design. Um, a sustainability and climate leader in her own right. Next to Gabriella is Jesse Barton. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't even look. Jennifer Ganton, Chief Movement Builder for Commonwealth Fusion Systems, the fusion company spin out of MIT. And next to Je uh, Jennifer is Jesse Barton, who leads communications for Helion on the other coast in the United States. Um, and uh, one of the two private fusion companies here today. We have private and public. And in the middle, she has the voice. So, Gabriella, let's put you on the hot seat. I want to start with you. You've inspired the world. Your leadership in sustainable uh, fashion and climate change. What brought you to Fusion? How did you find it? Well, I've been. I grew up in a ranch in South America, and nothing more sustainable and circular than a ranch. So, sustainability is a utilitarian aspect, and I've been working in my industry for two decades, but ten, 10 years really focused on sustainability. And the more I researched and the more breakthroughs that we did, I realized that as long as the world moves 85% in fossil fuels, we are walking into suicide. And when I started to hear about fusion in uh, I'm reading in an article, I became fascinated and I researched it for a show and, and I felt I uh, found the holy grail. Here's our solution. I am tired of hearing problems and I want solutions, so whatever capacities I have is to, to see uh, fusion happen for the future of all our children. Thank you. So Tim, tell us a little bit about the UK AA and where the UK stands in terms of fusion development. Thanks, Jane. Yes, the UK AA is the UK's national fusion lab. We've been working hard on fusion in R&D now for over 50 years, so it's our focus, it's what we do. And we believe that fusion can be a safe and sustainable part of the global future energy mix. And all of that is important. It's part of a mix because it won't just be the only energy source, although obviously alongside variable renewables, it's undoubtedly a global solution, if not a local solution, um, and we believe it to be safe and sustainable. It's an incredibly exciting energy opportunity. It's also technically challenging, so we're not there yet, but we're making extraordinary progress. And as you said, we're trying to recreate the process of the sun. It is the energy of the sun that keeps us all alive anyway, so we kind of know that fusion works up there. We're trying to do this on Earth. And I would say there's a lot of talk here about transition. Fusion as a field is in transition from being a research domain to being an industry that will deliver products. And the companies on this panel are testament to that. But I think it's really exciting that um, Gabriella and Chloe are hosting this panel. That, that shows that fusion is changing in a way that I'd never anticipated and is addressing you know, a much larger audience and becoming something that's justifiably, I think, very high profile right now. Thank you, Tim. All right, David. How do you see the US supporting its growing industry? Well. Let me first just say, I, I think that um, I am so excited. I think you said that there's more excitement than ever before. The way I like to put it is that when it comes to fusion, we're closer to the stars than ever before. I mean, really, we're closer to the stars in terms of, uh, uh, you know, harnessing the power of the sun, and we're closer to the stars uh, who are helping to raise the profile of fusion energy. Um, it is, we're in a fundamentally different place. This isn't just about another year has gone by uh, more research has been done, and we're getting closer and closer and closer to net energy gain. It's more than that. It's that we've had a paradigm shift, and that's what we in the U.S. government have taken note of. 
We've taken keen note of that. This is no longer just driven by important, necessary projects like ITER that are intergovernmental collaboration, and by the way, are still some of the most important areas where even governments that have significant differences with one another can engage in fundamentally important science for humankind. But it's also being driven by this bottom-up, innovative, entrepreneurial sort of investment and activity from firms just like Commonwealth Fusion and just like Helion. So uh, I think this is, you know, for us, this is terrifically exciting. And when you look at the, the amount of capital that's going in, as you noted in the, in the opening, I mean, this is smart money that's going towards Fusion, right? Th these are real investment dollars being deployed towards a source that can be quite an incredible lever for decarbonization. I think about it as one of those Archimedes levers, right? Give me, give me a lever and a place to stand and I shall move the world. I mean, this is truly, if we can achieve what is in the roadmap of so many companies up here, what is in the roadmap of the fusion industry, um, I think that we, what we will have is a, a, not just a promising, but a relevant new clean energy baseload source in a time frame that's realistic, the 2030s. So we have a new tool to address climate action, a new tool to enhance energy security, not only in the electricity sector, but also in other sectors as well, desalination, industry, and others, in a relevant time frame, in the next decade that's ahead of us where we will have to drive deeper decarbonization, including in sectors outside of, uh, outside of energy. So I know we'll speak a little bit more about what the UK is doing, what the US is doing, but I, you know, we come from that fundamental premise of fusion is not a science experiment. Fusion is not an R&D conversation or a science conversation. It can be those things. But for our office in the United States, fusion is also part of the climate conversation and it is part of the effort on, uh, on, on scaling up climate solutions. Thank you, David. This gets me excited. <laughs> what can you say? He captured it all. All right, Jennifer. Commonwealth Fusion Systems is building Spark, a device that will demonstrate the viability of your approach. What's new? Yeah, so um, it's pretty exciting to follow the other speakers. And Jesse and I are here to represent two of the 35 now private fusion companies that exist uh, developing commercial products for this space. So um, if we can go to the next slide. Yeah, so I, I'm with Commonwealth Fusion Systems, CFS, and uh, we were founded in 2018, as Jane said, spun out of MIT. And we now have 375 employees and we're working to leverage the decades of research that have been done in fusion energy um, through MIT and lots of other collaborations that we're doing now, uh, combining that with the speed of the private sector. And so we have designed Spark, as Jane referenced it. This is a net fusion energy device that we're building in Devons, Massachusetts. A core piece of that technology is the magnet. That's how you create the star in the bottle. You hold it with the magnets. Uh, in our device, and so we tested that core piece of technology, a high temperature superconducting magnet in September 2021 at scale, and had a very successful test to show the strongest fusion magnet. And now at this point, we have, are building a magnet factory in Devons, Massachusetts, and that is going to produce the magnets that roll across our campus and go right into the Spark device that we're building. And we plan to turn that device on and have that operational in 2025. And there, that device will demonstrate net energy. More power out than in, so you have a commercially viable product. And Spark is really paving the way for us uh, to demonstrate that, but we are already starting the design of our first fusion power plant, and that work is underway. And we anticipate the first fusion power plant going into the grid, putting fusion electricity watts on the grid in the early 2030s aligned with, as David said, a lot of the other private sector companies are doing this, um, but it also is aligning with the bold decadal vision that the White House and the DOE have launched to have fusion on the grid in the U.S. in the early 2030s. That's exciting. Soon enough to make a difference. Okay, Jesse. Helion has a different approach. What can you tell us about? Yeah, well, I think it's important first to say that I'm on this panel as a science communication expert. And for me, that means that I'm focused on the story of fusion. And luckily for me, uh, fusion has a beautiful story. At the beginning of the universe, fusion happened. Atoms collided, they created energy, they created matter, they created you, they created me. And fundamentally, 
We are all here, made by fusion and powered by fusion. And that's so beautiful. And as David said, we're getting to the point where we're closer to the stars than we've ever been before. Now, I work for an organization called Helion, and we are working to make this uh, a bigger story, and we're continuing that story. And the piece that we're working on is taking it from the universe and uh, being close to the stars to actually putting a star in a bottle on Earth uh, to create clean, carbon-free electricity for the first time. So at Helion, we've built six working fusion prototypes. Uh, you can see on the right is our sixth prototype called Trenta. Trenta did fusion every day for nearly two years, and that device was the first privately funded device to reach 100 million degree plasma temperatures, which is typically considered the temperature needed for commercial fusion conditions. That allowed us to uh, fundraise uh, $500 million with an additional $1.7 billion in commitments and also allowed us to grow our team and scale up the manufacturing capabilities so that way we can build as quickly as possible and get fusion onto the grid as quickly as possible. The picture to our left is our newest facility, which will house our seventh generation fusion prototype, which we expect to demonstrate net electricity so not just energy, but electricity from a fusion device in 2024. Uh, we are working very quickly. This building was built uh, in just about six months. It's 30,000 square feet, and it's the same size that will be needed for a commercial facility, which will be about 50 megawatts. And our goal is to produce electricity at one cent per kilowatt hour. So all of that to say, uh, Helion is working on this new story of fusion and seeing all of the partners, the, the commercial sector, the private sector, and the U.S. government working together to tell this story is amazing. And it's beautiful that we have Gabriella Hurst here to tell the story on a new level in a way that people might not have seen before. So I'm looking forward to a continued discussion. Thank you. So I just heard a lot of discussion that included Taiwan. And uh, fusion energy has been studied for a long time. It's been researched, it's been tested with, without commercial success for decades. Now we have over the over 30 public and private companies working on fusion, and I know I'm always wanting to share what's changed, why is this happening now. Jennifer, CFS has had the benefit of its proximity to MIT. What's changed in the landscape? What created the will to, to spin out CFS? Yeah, I, I think from our perspective, uh, it was a new material that was developed and is now available and in, in, has an industrial market, and that's the high temperature superconductor material I talked about that allows for very high field magnets. And so for us, this technology has really unlocked what we think is the ability to create small, compact, lower cost devices. And that's really the key to commercial fusion. Um, you really have to be able to compete, as Jesse was talking about, it will be being able to compete on a dollar per kilowatt hour as we move forward. And so the size of the device is, is really, a, in our view, the, com the advantage of why we think this will be will workable. We're also designing it in a way that it's a machine that is manufactured. And so we'll have a production line, we'll have the ability to create many of these machines. And so we think about it today as we're designing our device and all the work that's going into that, how is this scalable? Because if it's going to matter, if fusion's going to matter in the time for our goals in 2050, we have to put a lot of them out into the world. And so while we all have goals, um, I think it's almost 90% of the private fusion companies have stated they believe we'll have fusion on the grid in the early 2030s, but we're going to have to put a lot of fusion on the grid in the next coming decades. So we're designing this in a way that it's a manufacturable device that can be deployed globally at speed and at scale that's required to address climate change. Thank you. Jesse, what did you hear? Do you agree? What do you think is different? Yeah, I think when we're looking at fusion and why now for Helion, the things that are important for us is that we have uh, some, some private funding that has allowed us to build very quickly. Like I said, we've built six prototypes, which means that we've been able to iterate on the science, iterate on the physics, and really hone down on the engineering problems uh, and the engineering solutions. So now we're looking at a pace, because we had a, 
uh, amazing milestone achievements with our last machines, we know that we can build out quickly. Uh, that funding and the uh, support from the White House has helped us look at creating a manufacturing process. So we're bringing more manufacturing in-house. So just like Commonwealth, we're looking at building these machines inside our own facilities so that way we can get them out as quickly as possible. So we're looking at building fusion systems a day uh, so we can get gigawatts on the grid from clean baseload power as soon as we possibly can. Well, just to uh, echo what's changed, for me, the thing that's changed most in fusion is the realization that we need it. You don't need to go back very far when it felt like a research topic. But now I don't think we need to convince anybody of the need for low carbon baseload. So the, the need has transformed the field because we all know that when the global innovation community puts its mind to a technical challenge, it can solve them. There are lots of things that have to come together to deliver fusion. Some of it is about funding, some of it is about skills. I suspect we'll come back to that. Um, and a lot of it is about solving important technological challenges. But actually, that's not all that has to come together. One of the important things is the regulatory environment. Um, in the UK, the government announced fairly recently that it would be a different regulatory environment than traditional nuclear. And that's extremely important and beneficial to the emerging industry. And I think we all hope the US will be taking a similar path. Uh, and so that bringing together of national strategies, national funding, commercial funding, skills, and uh, addressing the remaining challenges and putting this on a pathway to being an industry that will deliver at scale are, are all the important things that are happening and hopefully all coming together now to deliver what we need. David, do you have anything you want to add now, or do you want to chime in later? No, I think, um, well, let me just commend the UK for the leadership that it's shown. I mean, I, I, I will say, uh, I think it's fair to say that, that there, there, is, there is an incredibly pioneering and thoughtful model in the UK about how to drive private innovation for public interest with, an, with a model that encourages creativity and still has all the necessary sort of, uh, you know, um, safeguards in it. I mean, we're obviously in the process of developing, I think, a, a rich and, and hopefully very similar kind of policy ecosystem in the United States. You're seeing it in bits and starts. You're seeing incentives put on. You're seeing support for manufacturing, like Jesse talked about. But I think when it comes also to understanding the differentiating qualities of fusion that separate it from traditional nuclear and, and thus a, a treatment that is um, that's commensurate with that, you're going to see that coming very soon, and I think the leadership and the example of the UK has shown is very important. But can I say one other thing? Because there's something in this room that really excites me, and I speak from an international-facing office, not one that's domestic-facing. We need to make sure that fusion is in our climate diplomacy conversations, and not just with the G7, and not just with our partners in the UK. How many people in the room are coming here from a developing country context. Just raise your hand really quickly if you're coming from a developing country context to this conversation, right? That's an incredible show of hands. I mean, really, think about that. That's a, that is extremely exciting, and I think we need to take note of that. I think we may need to make sure that we're integrating that into our conversation, and that we're not just thinking about fusion as a technology experiment for the G7, but indeed about as, as it as a solution that can be fundamentally transformative for developing countries and emerging economies around the world as well. So um, that's something that I know, I, I promise, we are going to be taking on in our international climate diplomacy. I, I just wanted to say that that was one of the reasons that I fell in love with fusion as well, because it touches the climate injustice subject. Because uh, just if you compare Africa that produces 5% of the greenhouse gases and everyone that's living in the tropics is paying the highest price for, for our climate crisis, the fact that we have here a potential source of energy that can leapfrog and give infrastructure, schools, hospitals, I really tackles 
what is so close to, to, to my heart. So I'm really happy to hear that, you, that, that this will be part of the agenda, of the intensity to have it in the agenda. Yeah, I, I think we see this a lot alike, um, as do many other companies, but CFS was founded on a set of sort of things we believe to be true in the world. And that's a big part of when we go to work every day, we believe this deeply and why we work so, we're working very hard. As a startup, we work really hard and lots of hours. But, uh, but the deep belief that we have is that safe, abundant, affordable, clean energy while preserving the environment for future generations is a basic human right. And that is something we talk about at work all the time. And so when we think about equity, we think about the ability of fusion to be deployed anywhere in the world. And it's not reliant on, does the wind blow strongly where you live? Does the sun shine all the time where you live? There's a role for renewables, but there are places where people maybe don't have the advantages where renewables will work as efficiently or they're importing just about all of their energy resources from other countries. And now you have an opportunity to build, a mach build machines in your country that you produce the energy yourselves. So in our mind, we think fusion really does offer an opportunity for equity of access to clean, affordable energy in every community. Um, and that's a really important part of the value proposition of fusion moving forward. And so we look forward to a day when we see these all across the globe and everybody's taking advantage. Yeah, and I would like to add to that and talking specifically about what David brought up, which is that we need fusion to be a part of these climate conversations. And for us, something that we can take away from COP is when we're thinking about fusion policy or policies around climate change, fusion should be in that mix. And if it's not, we need to make sure that policies are technology neutral to allow a space for fusion to come in. And right now, there's, you know, kind of this gray space. We're not sure what policy will look like in the U.S. I know that we're working on it. The U.K. is working on it as well. But globally, we need to see a technology neutral approach to how we look at fusion as part of the clean energy environment. Um, but just to also go off of what Jennifer said, when Helion is thinking about what we can do to increase accessibility to our generators, again, we're building generators that are 50 megawatt in scale, which is enough to power about 40,000 homes. So we're looking at communities that are uh, in the need of clean power. And the way that our fusion approach works, it's able to be hooked up to existing transmission lines and get to the grid very quickly without the, the steam turbines that might typically be needed in order for us to develop new clean energy infrastructure. So that's core to our mission as well, is making sure that people can have access to that. It's so exciting. Every time I talk to the different private companies, I realize how many different approaches and sizes and, and actually energy production there exist right now in private fusion development. And that means there are going to be a lot of opportunities to put this to work on climate change. So um, before I, I open up the, the discussion to uh, questions from the audience, I want to ask about supply chain. Because I was thinking about it as Jennifer was speaking and Jesse was, was speaking. In order to, you know, to build all of these we need to be ramping up that supply chain now. We have an incredible asset in Gabriella because Gabriella has done a tremendous job with supply, her supply chain, environmental and human footprint. Gabriella, what can you tell us about that? And what is your advice for fusion? Oh, me having to give advice to fusion? Okay, so 
the only the only thing I see, and I'm not going to talk about supply chain, but what I, I want to talk is the fact that I saw an opportunity. I think I have nothing against. So the way I saw it is, 85% of the world is mo moving in fossil fuels. Here you have the intermittent energies, solar panel, wind power, that while great, they cannot take all this capacity. And in the middle, you have hydrogen, nuclear fission, which I have no problem with it. It's just have that PR. But with fusion, what I saw is a communication bridge. I saw the silo communication that we all live today, where there's no cross-pollination. So what I tried to do with my platform of both companies that I work is try to bring more people to the awareness. Here's a solution. Keep the faith. Keep thinking that there's something that's coming. And tell good news. And you spoke about ITER. ITER is not only a fusion story, but a story where there's war in Ukraine, but Russia is still delivering the parts on time. So there's a higher level thinking that's happening in this world that needs to be focused on. And so I'm not giving fusion advice, but I'm telling what I fell in love with fusion. Thank you. All right. Jesse or Jennifer or both, there are many human material resources needed for commercial fusion. I'm curious about how you're going to grow, what, what needs to happen, and uh, beyond your personal team. What are you anticipating? Yeah, thanks for the question, Jane. So what's interesting about fusion, uh, for people who aren't as familiar with it, is, as Jesse mentioned, the supply chain, uh, or sort of the, how we reach the market, we can leverage existing infrastructure. So we can put fusion plants near access to the grid and just plug right into existing infrastructure. And when we think about what a fusion plant looks like, it may vary based on the company's design, but essentially what you need is to build a plant that then has all the balance of plant around it to capture heat, for example, and turn a turbine and to get the electricity. And so when we think about the supply chain and the workforce, these things exist today. <laughs> People, you know, we can put a fusion plant in a community that formerly had a coal plant in it. And these are workers that are trained who know how to build the infrastructure that's required for a power plant. They know how to run power plants. That talent is in that community. The difference is we're putting a fusion plant there that won't have any emissions or particulate emissions for the local community, so it's safer and healthier for those communities. So from a workforce perspective, we think about where we would go where, the, where there's a strong workforce, but we also know if fusion's going to scale, that we need to be training workforce to work in the fusion plants. So that includes leveraging the workforces that exist in communities and maybe even disadvantaged communities where there's been shutdowns of plants and doing some retraining. But then also thinking about some of the aspects of fusion that may require special training and working with university programs, working with uh, vocational schools, technical training programs on how we can grow a more diverse and equitable workforce that can be part of fusion energy in the future. So we think about it a lot. It's an early burgeoning industry, so we're just starting those initiatives. Um, but it's an exciting time right now. And what we're finding, you know, Gabriella is an example of people hear about fusion, they hear about the promise of what this could be, and they want to be involved. So we all have a lot of job openings. We have 100 job openings right now. Um, you can go check our website. <laughs> but all the companies now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But a lot of the companies have a lot of job openings right now. Um, so we're just really looking forward to getting the word out and people coming to us who are excited to be a part of this. And then also making sure people hear about Fusion and understand and what it is and want to learn more about it and doing that through universities and schools and other things. Jesse, you want to add something? Yeah, in terms of supply chain, things that Helion are thinking about are pieces that already exist in other technologies. So we're looking at, you know, scaling up semiconductor capabilities in the U.S., and we're starting to work closely with the U.S. government to bring semiconductor manufacturing into the U.S. in a way that will allow us to scale as fast as we can. So, and I know that the same, it's similar for CFS. It's a lot of off-the-shelf parts, but a lot of them. So that's kind of part of the, what we look at when we're looking at supply chain. And in terms of thinking about workforce, something that Helion's been doing a lot is working with our local community colleges. So these are universities that have a two-year de degree program that are maybe an associate's degree, 
And because we're building our machines in-house, we're looking for people with uh, experience in machining, uh, with technician work. And it's been really exciting because the most growth that's happened on our team in the last year has been on that production side. So individuals who have some maybe college training um, but are willing to fight for a really important mission and build fusion generators, which honestly coolest job in the world. I don't know why anybody wouldn't want to do that. So it's been really cool to see that happen uh, at our facilities in particular. Thank you. David and Tim, what would you add? Um, so obviously, I think supply chains are going to be incredibly important. If I can give both a few recommendations, but yeah, I mean, these are general recommendations to the government and to the industry on what we need to see happen, not only supply chains, but a, a bit beyond as well. I mean, number one is we need to start being thoughtful from the get-go about identifying where can there be intelligent redundancies among all the different uh, creative uh, approaches and, and designs that are being um, that are being scaled up by private sector actors. Where can there be some shared infrastructure, some common parts of the supply chain, so that we're not um, we're not making it overly costly at the get-go, and we're finding the efficiencies where they where we can. But also, I think, especially from a U.S. perspective. It's going to be very important also for the industry to try and understand what are likely to be some of the more sensitive parts of that supply chain. What are the true kind of commanding heights of, um, of the fusion ecosystem? And that's both in the actual material supply chain, but it's also because fusion is something that can draw on and touch on so many other sectors and so many different inputs. Things like semiconductors, for example. Things like the application of machine learning and big data to help with plasma containment, artificial intelligence to help with, uh, with plasma containment and doing that better and faster. This means that the success of fusion may actually touch on and impinge upon some sensitive technology areas. And I think beginning that dialogue early on with the US government, beginning that dialogue early on with, uh, with Congress and with others, is gonna be very important in engendering trust and, uh, and, and ensuring that there are no surprises later on. And then the other thing that I would just put forward is there's so much excitement about fusion now, but I think policymakers and the public alike are looking for kind of a roadmap or a set of roadmaps from the industry, from the fusion industry that sort of say, look, we know you're going to be a little bit skeptical of being sold an overly flowery story. So trust us, but test us. Test us by our own benchmarks that we set of what success looks like. Because this is a really interesting sort of technology development cycle where there's both incremental improvement, but there are also going to be these leapfrog moments, these threshold moments of significant positive change if we, if we you know, hit the goals that we're hoping to hit. And so helping folks to understand what that looks like, what does progress look like by 2025? How do we know if we're ahead of schedule, behind schedule? How do we know what the gaining moments are on the road to actually having commercial fusion? And then help the public and help policymakers be more educated consumers and ones that can feel like they're still scrutinizing and being skeptical, thoughtful consumers of what they're seeing in the taking place in the fusion sector. I think that's the, that is the telltale sign of a mature, self-confident industry. And that is one, one thing that I would encourage us all to work on coming out of COP27 and into next year. Right. It sounds like we need to uh, have a quick drop. This, this industry has to grow up very fast. Uh, yes, this industry has to grow up very fast. Actually, we're trying to do something, and I'm not sure whether it's been done before. Fusion still has outstanding research challenges, but we're building demonstrator machines, and we're beginning to design prototype machines, and we're beginning to talk about bringing on a supply chain to supply power plants. Now, that, that, there's a parallelism in that that's kind of slightly uncomfortable for us all because you'd think that you would do one after another after another, but we've decided there isn't time to do that. So we have to compress those timescales. I think we can probably borrow from other fields, and I'm really interested to know which fields have tackled that research to production in a collapsed timescale because that is the challenge that's facing us.
Thank you. Uh, my name is Johanna Kandjuska. I'm a journalist from Poland and I cover climate and energy for one of the most important economic uh, media in Poland. And I have a question, uh, if, I think to Tim, maybe, if you could go more into specifics if it comes to fusion, because I really don't understand the technology. I mean, uh, we talk about renewable energy in my country a lot, but I think that I have never heard about fusion. So if you could tell me more or less, what is the source of this energy? Heat or sun or I don't know, the space and then how it, it, it goes, like through magnet, like how, how those machines work, because to me it's like a, a bit, uh, you know, like a, <laughs> a mystery. A mystery, yes. And, and, and then um, I would like to know what are uh, perspectives uh, for this technology. If we build power plants based on fusion, for instance, uh, which, uh, you know, like uh, how many how, uh, how many gigawatts we can have installed in there, yes? Okay, so I'm going to jump in. It's a great question, but I want to bring a few other voices in before the, the panelists answer. I see you, and I see uh, you, and the gentleman on the end. I'll come back to the, also the lady in blue next to the lady in blue. Do you have microphones? Did you answer, Tim? Do you answer, Tim? No, no, we're going we're to come to the panelists after we gather some questions together. Oh, that's not working. Okay. You see, even the clock is set technically sound. Hello. Uh, yes, it's working. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for your great presentation. Uh, as a nuclear advocate myself, I'm really happy to see that all nuclear technologies, plural, are uh, being uh, promoted and will need and have their place in the energy transition coming out right now in the future energy mix. I wanted to uh, ask a question uh, to Gabriela here, so if she can uh, build upon her earlier answer. She said something that I found really interesting, which was, uh, I don't have anything against the current generation of nuclear, and I think the fusion uh, brings uh, an additional layer of excitement and perspective into the story. Um, I wanted to uh, ask uh, you in particular and all of you, uh, how did you feel that bridge was going to happen? What were the requirements for that ecosystem that all of those nuclear technologies, generation four, generation three fusion, will require to happen and to actually uh, take on and endorse the role that uh, they are meant uh, to endorse uh, in the future. Thank you. Fusion doesn't use your, I'm just going to answer because it's one sentence. Fusion doesn't use uranium. Okay, I'm going to go on to this gentleman and then we're going to keep on going. Hello. Um, full disclosure, I used to work on fusion uh, many, many years ago. And in fact, I'm a 1982 graduate of the Column Plasma Physics course. Thank you, guys. I needed to get vetted by Harwell. Um, this one's better. Okay. Um, so two questions, if I may. Uh, when working in fusion, we always had this idea that fusion would be 25 years down the, down, the, down the line for 25 years. And now I'm listening to you people, and uh, I hear 12 years, which is a uh, you know, fantastic development. My question is, what would happen would public funding for fusion be doubled? over, say, five years, when public funding for fusion research would be doubled. Okay, again, uh, and, and another question. I have a recommendation for you, David. Start out your diplomacy with a scholarship program to people from developing countries to come and work for fusion. Uh, it'll work. Trust me. Cheap labor, smart labor. All right, we have 10 minutes left. We can go to these. Let's answer these, and then I'm going to keep going to the, the audience and see if I have other questions coming in. Can I, can I start with your question? I'm, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name. I'm just going to interrupt to say it's getting very loud outside. I, really will, I, will, I will speak. Microphone. I will eat the microphone. So fusion is when light atoms combine to make a heavier atom and release energy. It's at the other end of the reaction from fission, which we would call conventional nuclear, where you take a heavy atom and split it into two, and that releases energy. 
typically in a fusion reaction, not always, but typically, it's hydrogen joining together to make a heavier atom. And most commonly, it's hydrogen and hydrogen fusing to make helium. The sun is about 75% hydrogen, and it's fusing that together and producing a huge amount of power, which we're benefiting from on Earth. So it's about taking light atoms, forcing them together to make a heavier one, and that process gives out energy which can become heat. So in a conventional power station geometry, you'd use that heat to make steam to turn a turbine to generate electricity to keep the lights on. And it sounds simple, but the catch is that those two heavy nuclei don't really want to fuse together. So you really have to force them to, and it's that forcing them to that's difficult. And quite often we talk about extreme temperatures, because only by heating those to over 100 million degrees do they actually get forced together. And when they're close enough, they do decide to fuse, make something heavier, and give off energy. And that's the process of fusion. I'm, I'm sorry if I've kind of glossed over details, but I hope that's it in a, in a nutshell. So the reason you need magnets is because if you've got something that's over 100 million degrees, you can't hold it in any material because it would vaporize. So the only way of containing it is in a magnetic field or a magnetic bottle. So the magnets keep that plasma, as it's called, in a safe place where it can do its fusion stuff, generate power, and not come into contact with the wall of the machine because it would, it would just burn a hole in it. And I know that people are going to want to keep talking, and I absolutely encourage us to all do that after the session. But I just want to make sure that all of the questions that have been asked and the questions that still exist get some time. I want to jump in on your question on how fusion and fission might play together. Is that the question? And bridge together. Yeah. Yeah, so I think whenever we, whenever fusion companies are looking uh, at how we put fusion on the grid, uh, we think about all of the renewable energy that would be needed in order to power, I think today the BBC reported that we've now reached 8 billion people on Earth, which means, and that's happened, we've gone from 7 billion people to 8 billion people in 12 years. And I don't think that we're slowing down, we might be a bit, but that means that we're going to meet, need more energy than we've ever needed before. And as we look at replacing fossil fuels, we're looking at 3,000 gigawatts of fossil fuels that are currently on the grid. And if we're going to replace that, it's going to take fusion, it's going to take wind, it's going to take solar, and it's going to take traditional nuclear, like fission. So I think all of this together, we see different uses in different places. So for instance, Helion's building a 50 megawatt system, which means we're looking at, again, 40,000 homes, data centers, industrial settings, similar to what like a coal plant might currently uh, power, but there's still a place for fission on the grid, and that will help the whole clean energy ecosystem round out well. Okay, do you have any other answers that need to be offered? I know we've got questions burning. Let me just quickly, uh, let me just quickly answer the, the question from here. But let me preface it by saying that Farid is far too modest because he forgot to identify himself as the climate envoy of Iraq. And I just want to say he has an incredible background, he's an incredible environmentalist and scientist himself. And uh, I think we should all actually be quite honored to have, uh, to have Iraq's climate envoy here with us today. You raised two excellent points. Number one is absolute, so I personally, I'm very excited uh, to see the day, and it can't come quickly enough, when we double our amount of public funding for fusion, and we and I hope that we do so in two different ways. Number one, that we do so in a way which may, is inc increasingly commercially relevant funding uh, that also helps to lift up the supply chains and the overall ecosystem that we need. And I also hope that we explore the possibilities of some of the government funding for the fusion sector also being not just about supply push, but about demand pull. Uh, the power of demand signals for commercializing emerging technologies can be incredibly powerful. One of the uh, leading public-private partnerships that we've created as the United States government is called the First Movers Coalition. It has some of the biggest companies in the world. We've got 67 corporations representing about eight and a half trillion dollars worth of market cap. We ask the Amazons and the Googles and the Maersks and the Fords and the Volvos of the world and the Googles or you know, the Microsofts of the world to make 
purchase commitments that in the year 2030, a certain amount of their steel purchases, if they're automakers, or a certain amount of their shipping of goods, if they're Amazon or retailers, will be done using the zero emissions version of the product in question. Okay, so, David, I'm going to cut you off there because I know there are more questions and I know we're almost out of time. Brilliant. Carry on. All right. Let me just quickly uh, start with the gentleman at the end who's been very patient. Then this, this uh, actually is a board member of mine, so I have to acknowledge her, uh, Mary Claire. And I do want to get at least one question from the audience. Uh, the viewing audience. Hi, thank you all very much. My name is Nicole with Save the Children, and um, I wanted to ask a little bit more about the implementation of your vision. Um, specifically, it sounds like a significant investment for these plants, and it's sort of a two-part question. One is, it sounds like this is only grid-based, but maybe you can confirm if it's only grid-based or if it's distributable. Um, that's one, to power the last mile, which is really critical. Second, is um, how are you thinking about localizing your supply chain when it comes to materials and jobs and the workforce? And in, that, in the, both of those senses, how are you thinking about partnerships? So I would love to hear a little bit more on okay, this. Okay, and then I, we're going to go quickly to this gentleman who's been patient, and then... No, no, Hi, my name is Jay Collins from City. I'd just be very interested in the LCOE levelized costs, wh where you are today, where you expect to be with scale over time, and what policy inducement you need. Okay, and then we'll wrap up in the, in the audience here. Questions? Sure, can you hear me? Um, I'm Michael Corafo. I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer for McCormick. And David, my question is actually to you directly. I don't want to wander around the books, right? Um, so if I look at um, fission, it's a well understood science, no question about it. But as a, as a platform for energy, it's fairly nascent. My question is this, you talk about uh, first mover companies. What in the IRA uh, can you say is money dedicated to facilitating an ecosystem based on collaboration rather than having things, you know, to your tents, everybody, you know, to bring this to a real commercial reality by encouraging companies to work together. What can you say about that? So that's the specific question. Thank you. Okay. And then, uh, you want to finish this up here? Sure. My question is looking forward. I'm Professor Marie Claire Cordonier Sager, Executive Secretary of the Climate Law and Governance Initiative and a professor in Cambridge and in Canada. I'm very interested in fusion because my 17-year-old son, who is a climate striker and a physicist, thinks this is the only way forward for his generation. And it's because it isn't pulling in the uranium. He sees fusion as us connecting up and catching up with the rest of the universe that powers itself that way. So I just have one question. How do we encourage young people like that with a conscience to come into this industry in a big way and I would follow it up with renewables didn't get where they are today because they just created themselves. They had strong regulatory incentives. What could climate law and governance do? Just asking. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to let the panelists take these on. Uh, anybody want to jump in first? jump in very quickly and just say uh, two quick things. Number one, uh, I'll leave it to others to speak to the latest LCOE numbers, levelized cost of energy numbers, but I will make one note, which is LCOE can oftentimes underestimate the value of baseload and the value of flexibility. So keep that in mind as well. Don't view it as just the single number. It will actually hide some of the additional value offered by Fusion. Secondly, uh, to your question, sir, uh, the, it's a great question. In, in, the, uh, in the Inflation Reduction Act, but also beyond it, we've got clean energy manufacturing tax incentives that um, absolutely the fusion industry should be able to avail itself of. We have sp some specific targeted money from DOE for fusion and early stage uh, fusion deployment and, and demonstration. Uh, and then beyond that, I think the other thing we all need to move on is to make sure that we're encouraging at the federal and the state level support for 24-7 carbon-free energy, okay, which the Biden administration is pushing on. that we are now cut off. This is the end, and I apologize to all whose questions didn't get answered. I encourage everybody to talk 
to any panelists who can grab. And I just want to uh, plug the people I get to work amongst and with. This is an incredibly exciting time in a place that's growing, in, an, in a sector that's growing by leaps and bounds. I talk about fusion all the time, every day. And what's shocking to me, always, is that the, the younger people, under 30, already know. Of course, they already know everything. So with that, I thank you all. And to the UNFCC.